are both parents. And a lot of this came out of our own discussion on how to cope with um, what's going on as both as parents and as public health professionals. So Archana, why don't you take it away? Can everyone hear me? Okay. Um, thank you for that introduction and for joining today um, on this forum to talk about how we as parents can use strategies and skills such as mindfulness among others to better support ourselves, our children, and to manage family communications through the coronavirus pandemic. Um, as a psychologist, I work with children and families on their concerns related to severe stresses and potentially traumatic events and bereavement. And um, I also conduct research in this area. So for me, this is sort of a unique opportunity to bring together um, you know, on a wider platform information that, that we use clinically a lot of times. So today I'm gonna to focus on three main things. First, uh, I wanna provide a context for the talk um, to remind ourselves that you know, we exist within an interconnected layered series of systems. And kids grow up in you know, families, but also in schools and faith-based institutions. Um, but of all of these systems, we know that parents and really any consistent caregivers um, have uh, influenced kids the most. Second, uh, I'm gonna focus on communication as one of the most important ways in which we can support our children at any time, but especially right now. And third, that caring for children actually begins with self-care. Um, and the more we invest in uh, our own self-care, we are better able to cope as well as to support. In particular, I will talk about mindfulness as being the bedrock of all of the other strategies and ideas um, that we might use along the way. So, by way of context, as I said, um, you know, we are embedded within a layered context and all of these systems are interconnected and influence each other. This means that right now, for example, when schools and after school programs and other systems and communities that shape our identities and provide meaning and structure are not available to our children or uh, to us, at least not in the traditional sense, um, all of us are going to be affected. It also, however, means that when we <laughs> support the systems and layers that are available, we can support our kids. So we know that children learn to make sense of their experiences and the information that they get within these systems, particularly within their closest relationships, usually with their parents. It's helpful to remind ourselves that um, in times like this, in fact, buffering and supporting uh, support can be very protective in facing challenges. In fact, research does suggest that supporting parents enhances children's resilience. With that context in mind, um, I'm gonna switch to talking about communication. Um, this is one of the most important ways of staying connected with our kids and frankly, all, our, all the different systems um, that we are a part of. And um, although I'll talk about many different themes related to communication, it's helpful to bear in mind that all communication has essentially two fundamental elements. There's an informational element to it, but there's almost always an emotional element to it as well. And you'll see, uh, we'll touch on these as we go along. Um, for those of you who might have tuned in last week, or if you're new, uh, please note that um, for today's talk, I'm really talking about um, some of the core themes or common parental concerns and how to use communication to address that, uh, some of those concerns. But there is a much more detailed handout available on the uh, public access drive through Kirsten's group, where there are very specific examples um, by age group um, with specific language that you could consider using or particular behavioral strategies that might work for different um, age groups. So I know we all know this, um, but I really like um, Dr. Rausch's very simple uh, reminders, essentially. Um, children talk to parents when they believe that we are listening. 
They talk when they believe that um, parents are open to new information. And it is in these conversations that children learn the words to use and to make sense of their own experiences. And so when they come to us with questions or um, you know, questions about what they're seeing or questions about what they're experiencing, um, using kind of age appropriate, factual, simple communication is what research supports. So telling them um, if they're younger, uh, talking to them about germs. I mean, really preschool and up, most kids understand the concept of germs and being sick. But if they're older, like with adolescents, they are accessing information much like adults and being able to talk to them in uh, age appropriate factual ways is helpful in helping them understand what they are experiencing. Um, you know, engaging kids in conversation for me means, um, you know, learning to listen and listening to learn, which is to say, we want to find out what questions are really on their mind. Every child and family is going to experience this differently. And most kids, regardless of what age they are, are really going to be asking questions in terms of how this pandemic is playing out in their lives. Some people are going to be worried about homeworks and deadlines. Um, college returning students are talking about the loss for seniors in terms of potential loss of the graduation and the senior year experience. Younger kids are probably um, thrilled to be home with their parents, but might be wondering about why they can't go on the swings in the playground all of a sudden. So really thinking about what question is on your child's mind is the most effective way of kind of helping to support and address their concerns. Another common parental concern is around media exposure and how to balance staying informed without getting overwhelmed. Um, although I talk about this in the handout um, by different age groups for all ages, um, for me, this question really primarily comes up with adolescents and preteens. And so I highlight here some you know, main points that can be helpful to think about. With adolescents, I think the key is really to listen and listen some more um, because it helps you know what types of information they might be getting from friends and social media or online sources. It can be helpful in um, having them consider and identify trusted news sources at a time when we know there's a lot of misinformation um, online. The other thing that I've been thinking more about recently is that, you know, in a fear-based environment with a lot of uncertainty, there is this sort of um, sense of protection that parents have around how do I support my kids to kind of, you know, still have some healthy curiosity about what is going on. So especially if you have a budding scientist or a doctor or someone who's just, you know, interested in science in general, um, I think finding content that is age appropriate, aligns with their interests, um, can also still maintain um, their natural curiosity. Um, so you can provide healthy choices, um, including, you know, sometimes just watching family movies together and things that are unrelated to the pandemic. And finally, I would say that, um, you know, children do as they experience and usually not as they are told. And so when we model healthy, appropriate boundaries um, with our own media use, kids are much more likely to do it themselves. Talking to kids and checking in with them regularly um, and asking about what they might be hearing from school or friends um, or on social media and other sources can also be helpful in knowing, um, you know, uh, how you can support your children in avoiding blame and stereotype. You might, for example, say something like sometimes people cope with their own worry by blaming others. And that this has not only emotionally um, damaging consequences, but also at this time in particular, it can be damaging because people may be less likely to seek medical help if they fear being bullied or judged for being sick. Emotionally speaking, um, 
asking and not assuming is probably the main theme here. Um, children are going to experience a variety of feelings and they're going to differ um, in how they react. Um, acknowledging and validating their feelings is one of the key things. And what this really means to validate is to communicate to them that you understand why they might be feeling that they are. So I know sometimes parents say that, you know, it's really hard to, um, you know, validate my child when they are being very upset or angry. And that totally makes sense. Just hold in mind that validation is really not about agreeing with them, though a lot of times you might be because you might share their anxieties or their worries. Validating is really saying that you understand why they might be feeling the way they are. Following that with realistic reassurance. So generally speaking, I advise against saying something like there's nothing to worry about. Um, worry can be uh, protective. Worry can actually be helpful. And it is, um, given the circumstances, it's something most of us are experiencing in some form or the other. Um, but you can provide realistic assurance. So for example, highlighting that you as a family, as uh, the school systems, they're all taking steps as advised by public health officials, doctors or scientists, um, and you are doing the best you can and that is going to help both uh, you, uh, the individual, the family, but also everyone around you. The key goal in thinking about, you know, talking about kind of emotional aspects is that we want our kids to not feel alone with their worries. We also know that different children respond differently to the same information. So some children tend to be worriers um, and others may seem relatively unaffected by the same experience. And so, you know, um, I think parents are the experts on their kids. They understand them and know them well. And so considering, um, you know, developmentally where your child is, what their temperament or personality is like can be helpful in thinking about um, how they may respond and what can be helpful for them. Um, I will say that at this time, experiencing extra worries is likely to affect, um, you know, may affect how they're thinking and feeling, perhaps motivation um, in terms of getting, you know, schoolwork done. You may even notice some behavioral changes and some changes are uh, probably predictable. Um, in general, there's likely to be an increase in emotionality. So even things that seem unrelated to the pandemic, I mean, it could be, uh, uh, you know, a, a bigger than expected fight over sharing the remote between siblings. Why does it have to be such a big deal? Well, it, it's probably not a big deal, but at this time, things feel bigger. There's a general increase in emotionality and that might play out in day-to-day -day stuff. So if you're wondering about why there's so much fighting, it's probably related to a general sense of increase in worry. So how can we support our kids? Um, well, so in addition to communication, the other core thing uh, that you can do is actually by supporting yourself. It may seem paradoxical to you know, in some ways divert your attention or at least part of it towards yourself. But, you know, we are all interconnected and what affects you affects your kids and vice versa. And so, and, and, and also as parents, we generally speaking are really, really bad at prioritizing our own needs. It's kids, work, um, probably other people that you're taking care of. Um, and then you're lucky if you get five hours of sleep. Um, but at this time in particular, uh, as a reminder, other systems that organize and support us and our kids are not available or at least are partially not available. And so buffering and strengthening the core systems that are accessible to kids, which is the family and the parents, is particularly important. You may feel like you are making this up as you go along. And I mean, I think this pretty much sums it up in terms of parenting on an everyday basis is we're not going to know all the answers. And a lot of times we are making it up as we go along. We're going to be asked some questions that we don't really know how to respond to or come across a situation we don't know how to handle and say something like cheesecake is spicy and that's okay. But 
on the other hand, we also do have a lot of experience because we are already used to staying up and worrying with them, helping them feel better when they were sick or struggling with a friend or something related to homework or struggles in school. And you do know your child. In fact, in my clinical work with parents, I almost always ask them some version of this question. What has worked for you or your child in the past? It's also helpful to remind ourselves that we do actually have experience with this in other ways as well. As a community, we have, even just in the past few years, experienced other community level severe and traumatic stressors. And we have also been in a situation where we have been confined within our homes um, because of bad weather. And um, in some ways, as we are increasingly spending more and more time at home, that experience from the past is going to be helpful. It's kind of like a rainy day, except we know the weather prediction is for many, many, many rainy days. It's not exactly the same as what we've experienced in the past, but we can take elements of what we know as families and parents to plan for what we know is coming in the few weeks. Um, it's helpful also to remind ourselves that um, planning and panicking are both very effortful, but in fact, in the end, only one of them actually helps. Um, all right, so what are some, you know, things we can actually do? Um, in terms of thinking about, uh, you know, creatively thinking about what are things through the day that either you or your kids can focus on that you can control? At a time when so much feels uncertain or out of control, thinking about the day-to-day -day stuff that kids can choose for themselves can be helpful. For younger kids, it could even be something small like washing hands regularly. And then second, to plan for regular and consistent replenishment to build up your emotional stamina for this marathon and potentially an ultra marathon. I highlight the word regular because, I highlight the word regular because um, it's kind of like building a muscle and you're much more likely to be able to draw on your emotional reserves if you're building them up. So think about experiences that make you feel maybe more upbeat. Think about activities that help you calm down. Make a plan intentionally for this. A lot of parents have asked about this recently. How do I balance flexibility and routines? How important is it to have routine? While there's no one answer for you know, a, a blanket answer or solution for all of us, I, the balance for you is between, the balance is really between flexibility and some routine. Routines provide some sense of stability, certainly uh, to all of us, but also for kids. And it can help us feel like life is predictable when a lot else feels out of control. Consciously prioritize positive coping strategies. Um, a college student recently who's back home um, said that he and his family are making a list, daily list of four things that they like to do that make them happy and that will be positive coping strategies for them. And so I highlighted here the three that I think are extremely important. Um, staying active um, and trying to get out of the house while practicing physical distancing is, can be very helpful. There's a lot of research to support this and my colleagues in later talks will talk about uh, some of these in more detail. Staying socially and emotionally uh, connected through technology so that um, you're not feeling as isolated as we are working from home and um, not having access to colleagues and friends as we typically would and prioritizing sleep as much as you can. And whatever combination of things that works for you. For kids, spending time reading or playing together and actually thinking about favorite books or games or movies, things from the past that have positive associations and are comforting, bringing those out right now can be very helpful. 
So to sum it up, I would say, you know, building consistent practices that help you to cope and to support is one of the primary things that you can do right now. And it can support resilience and adaptation if we think about this, uh, particularly as a process, not as something you have or don't have, but something that you can build into and work towards. Of course, we know that we're not going to get it right each time. You are, there's probably going to be times when we also perhaps say more than we wanted to or are ourselves more emotional in our responses to our kids than we would like to be. And, um, you know, now's a good time to intentionally remind ourselves that um, that's going, it's probably, it might happen. And um, to forgive yourself and not hold yourself to the standards that you typically might. And we know there's a lot of, you know, relationship, uh, you know, re research on relationships, including with parents and kids, but really any relationship where, you know, mistakes happen um, and uh, we say things we, we don't mean. But the key is really the capacity to recognize that and to repair it. And all of this occurs in kind of day to day interactions and every day all interactions offer multiple opportunities for us to repair something if we, if we feel that that's what's needed. Um, kids might ask questions that we don't know the answers to, and you know, we may not know the answers, but you can model for them how to try and figure it out, to model that we are all doing the best we can. And if you know, mistakes happen, those are all teachable moments. All right, so um, I'm going to shift now to really talking about mindfulness in particular and why this is sort of a bedrock skill. There's a lot of research to support this. I'm not going to review the research, but I will just talk very briefly about what it is and then we'll practice one together. Um, so mindfulness, I, I imagine many of you have heard about it, but it's really the um, intentional practice of bringing your awareness to a particular aspect of your experience. Um, and not without judgment. And so a simple example of that would be, I think, uh, you know, like focusing on your breath, for example. Um, your mind is going to wander. You are going to worry about the next meeting, um, how you're going to get through some work-related deadline. And that would be totally uh, predictable, in fact. That's what our attention does. And mindfulness is the practice then of becoming aware of the fact that your attention has wandered and bringing it back to your breath or whatever the aspect of the experiences that you're focusing on and not judging yourself for it. You might be wondering how this relates to emotion regulation. And so just a note about that is there's a lot of research to support this too, is that regular practice of mindfulness helps us in the moments when we in fact most needed to become more quickly aware of what our own emotional state is, and then to bring that intentional presence to respond and not to react. There are plenty of ideas online for kids, adults, and family-based activities to practice mindfulness. And so I didn't put this in the resource list because you can really find these examples quite easily. Wow. For me, it's helpful to um, you know, use this image, which I have used many times before um, in thinking about mindfulness, which is an emotion regulation, which is that um, you know, the weather is going to change and it might be stormy um, at times on the surface of things. But mindfulness is the practice that helps you maintain your intentional awareness of your emotions to stay at the ocean bed where it is much more calm you are more likely to recognize choppy emotions and big emotions when they're coming and much less likely to get caught up in them. So as an example, um, especially for um, this period of uncertainty, uh, perhaps for, uh, you know, understand from what we know right now, a long duration, one of the things that may come up, for example, is periods of time when you feel more worried frustrated, even angry, being able to recognize these shifts in our emotions and then practicing consciously to shift your focus to something else right now that would be helpful. That would be an example of how mindfulness could help you. 
And um, I heard somebody else say this is it's, you know, and I thought it was very simple. You know, we might wonder about what good we have done as, you know, public health officials as a country or in any other way. Why did this, you know, play out the way it is playing out right now? There will be plenty of time to think about that. And if there are productive ways in which you can do it without ruminating on it, that's great. But if it's only serving to add to your worries and anxieties right now, then developing this conscious practice of mindfulness can help you shift from this why to what do I need to do right now and how do I do it? So I put up some examples here that are actually from some of the um, you know, families that I work with at MGH. Um, and um, I, you know, I thought they were also funny, which is kind of my humor is my go-to primary coping mechanism. But these are some kind of you know, small examples that have come up in, of ways in which people are shifting their attention intentionally in terms of what they're choosing to attend to right now. So for example, uh, yes, it is hard that we, our work lives are disrupted. At the same time, people are also able to feel gratitude for the fact that you know, our weather, the weather right now is actually pretty good um, on most days. And um, we are able to still go out. And in fact, practicing, uh, you know, we can both be active and practice physical distancing in large open spaces. Um, I know this is a bit tricky because some parks, I mean, even in our own neighborhood, there were parks that were open last week. And then two days ago, we really stopped having access to it. Um, but I also know uh, from actually some colleagues that some of the larger um, state parks and reservations, their visitor centers are closed, but the landscapes are open. But, you know, this is, of course, dynamically changing, but for now, we are able to go out and, um, you know, maybe feeling gratitude for that is something um, that we could focus on. Uh, a colleague told, who had been really worried about how her kids were gonna manage, suddenly said to me, you know, this has actually turned out better because my older son has taken on homeschooling the younger one. He comes up with very creative school plans for, uh, you know, my younger son. And I have more help than I expected. Um, I had a friend tell me that she, she has known her husband for 20 years and she just learned that he seemed to be confused about the rules for rock, paper, scissors. A college student returning home said, joked and said, um, you know, I've been practicing social distancing already. I'm doing it really well with my family. So I think these are, you know, just some examples of making lemonade, um, but these are simple things and ways in which we can shift our attention to what now and how. Um, I think for us as parents, building resilience as a community is also, you know, very critical to supporting ourselves. Forums like these, staying connected with your colleagues and family um, are really key. As individuals and families, we have unique challenges. We have all heard stories in the past few days of confused questions from kids, sadness about the senior year ending on this note perhaps, to more challenging dilemmas of medically vulnerable families grappling with the logistics and emotional implications of needing to separate themselves from their own family members. Some colleagues um, prior to this forum have reached out to talk about ways in which they are already noticing that disparities within communities, something that many of us at Harvard Gen focus on in our research work, is also uh, playing out in the ways that we can all cope with this. Access to resources such as digital access, flexibility in terms of being able to work, those are all things that are very, very variable. At the same time, we have also heard of very creative solutions of people coming together as communities and finding ways to connect and thinking about what we can do right now in terms of uh, building communities. Uh, a couple different ideas that came up just before the talk, um, you know, developing a shared Google form for sharing ideas that are working for uh, parents in supporting their kids, resource lists, 20 minute mindfulness virtual meetings to debrief, practice mindfulness and share ideas about um, parenting. And while we may not be able to share and process all of it today, um, our hope in this forum is to at least start the conversation in, in terms of thinking about solutions. Um, I am practicing, uh, 
you know, a, a little bit of separation from the news and really reading it in small doses. So I think most of you probably heard of this in the news. Um, but one of my friends happens to be um, in a lockdown situation in Italy and was telling me about the fact that um, Italians are coming together at noon to clap and applaud the efforts of the health professionals there and in, at noon and then coming together to sing together um, on their balconies in the evenings. I would just like to take a moment to acknowledge my communities um, right now that have been particularly helpful um, turning this talk around uh, in short notice. There was a whole team of people that um, provided support um, that I'm grateful for. And with that, um, I'm going to, uh, before we open up the forum for discussion, invite you to practice a one minute of mindfulness practice um, focused on gratitude. So um, for this particular exercise, um, I would invite you to just be able to hear the instructions so you can step away from the keyboard, um, sit comfortably in your chair. If it's helpful for you, um, you can choose to not have the video on. Close your eyes and just uh, get in a comfortable position that you can maintain for a minute. Let's start by taking three deep breaths. Exhale through your mouth. Take another deep breath, this time a little deeper, and breathe out through your mouth. In this final breath, Go deeper still and see if you can breathe into your belly. Just with a deep exhale through your mouth. When I sound the bell, I'm going to be quiet and we can take a minute at this time when each of us is coping with a lot of changes and a feeling of loss and unpredictability to intentionally shift our focus to something that you have felt grateful for in the past week. You might be grateful for something unexpected that someone you had never thought of did for you. A positive quality of someone that may be sometimes hard to get along with. Maybe you learned a really valuable lesson from a hard experience or something that made you laugh. With that, we'll open it up to the forum to talk about, invite questions, comments, ideas, um, things you found helpful, things we could do together to support ourselves. Hi, uh, my name is Bernadette. I'm a graduate student at Harvard and I'm doing research in Lima, Peru. Um, I want to offer my insights 
um, we went into lockdown as a country uh, yesterday. And so if anyone uh, would like to know what the process was like or how to prepare for it or, or what I found to be helpful, um, just send me a note on the chat and I'm happy to, to share those thoughts. Yeah, um, Ber yeah, Bernadette, if you, um, so other people are sharing, someone from Chile is doing now the same in, lock, in um, lockdown. So if people, um, maybe easiest if people do it on the, on the chat, but if people who are going through those experiences um, want to share, that would be great. And I think, and, and Obizu is going to field the other questions that are coming through. Yeah, so while folks are writing their questions, um, maybe Archana, could you reflect on this question? Please include, include grandparents as many school districts have families headed by grandparents and kids have different issues in those households. Yeah, I, and I totally agree. And as I said at the outset, you know, even though I use the term parenting throughout, this is really about any adult who is in a consistent caregiving role with kids. Um, and certainly with grandparents too, um, for those of us who have an extended family nearby, um, the loss of that ongoing connection um, is confusing and sad for kids. Um, and I think, uh, you know, one of the things we know right now is that the elderly have to be particularly careful um, because they are more susceptible to the virus. And so um, I think thinking of ways, um, you know, to stay connected, whether it is by video conferencing, if they have smartphones, um, I know while a lot of people have that, that's not always possible, or a good old fashioned phone call. With younger kids, it, it can actually be an engaging activity to sort of um, make cards or write letters, crafts that they can make that they could share at a later time. Um, so I think the key thing is how do we stay connected with those systems of support um, that are important for kids? Um, I don't know if other people have other thoughts that they would like to share or things that they are doing to stay connected with their extended family. So thanks everyone for um, some of you are writing that that you share resources. We'll collate those and be able to share them uh, with the group. Um, there's another question, and maybe I think you know an insight, um, Arshana. Uh, I have a toddler, and I found it helpful to shift his sleep schedule to wake later in the day and stay up late. It makes staying inside and not going to the park a little easier. Could you talk a little bit maybe about um, sleep routines and you know, uh, sometimes shifting schedules? Yeah, um, that is a great suggestion. And actually, um, so I have a, a preschooler and um, actually it's something that I have done in a different way. So, um, but you know, when, uh, you know, Parents might have gotten this um, advice at some point, which was, you know, uh, try to rest when your kids are resting, like especially postpartum. And I've kind of taken that forward. Um, but aligning sleep schedules with your, while you're trying to balance working from home can be especially helpful. So building in uh, some time for yourself individually, whether to take care of yourself, whether to focus on work, whatever it is that you need to prioritize in that given day while your kids are sleeping, I think can be incredibly helpful. One thing that um, a few of us have found challenging is that you know our kids are not getting as much exercise as they typically would. And so their sleep uh, you know, cycle is just getting naturally uh, kind of you know, disrupted. And so, again, prioritizing ways in which they can, you know, stay as active as they can so that they can, you know, still sleep um, as well as they probably typically would um, can be very helpful. Um, and I don't know, if, do people have other ideas around sleep schedules for their kids and themselves that they've found helpful?
I can, I'm writing out my thoughts to share with everyone, but I can share one thing. Um, I started to have symptoms uh, last week and I got confused with what a symptom was with what feeling tired was. So um, my experience was if I feel achy and I feel exhausted or there's just too much going on mm -hmm. to choose uh, to, to take a nap, <laughs> you know, to not try to sit there and like think, oh my gosh, do I have the virus? Am I tired? Am I stressed? You know, just say, okay, the bottom line is I feel achy and I feel tired and I'm going to close my eyes. And uh, I found that to be extremely helpful. The other one, which is correlated to that is I've been feeling worn out by the end of the day. And uh, again, it's like 10 o'clock at night and I'm thinking, oh, I definitely have coronavirus. And I'm thinking, no, it's 10 o'clock. So uh, trying not to conflate symptoms with just it's 10 p.m., it's time to go to bed. Um, or I can take a 20 minute nap now, or you know, I can just stop working or do what I'm doing. So conflating symptoms with just natural tiredness um, and, and taking action has been helpful for me. Those are great examples, actually, both of what many of us are, you know, likely to do, which is sort of this information is foremost on our mind. This worry is foremost on our mind. And so even mundane, seemingly mundane things like being tired, even though it's 10 o'clock and we've been up a lot, but jumping to that conclusion is uh, you know, probably going to happen more than we typically would. But on the flip side, that was also a great example, Bernadette, of um, you know, walking yourself out of that sort of catastrophizing and jumping to conclusion to, well, let's start with what's more likely to be happening. Um, Dr. Conan, maybe I could call on you on this question. Um, a parent is asking, many schools have moved to homeschooling, which is not always possible to oversee as a working parent with elementary school children. Do you have any strategies that you recommend for balancing school schedules in homeschooling format and still trying to balance work schedules? <laughs> I would love those suggestions. <laughs> I don't know. Do I have suggestions? Um, um, I would love to hear other people's suggestions because it depends widely on um, wildly on um, the ages of um, kids. Uh, my son is is twelve, um, and so and I am working. My schedule has not gotten less busy. In fact, it's gotten more busy. My work schedule yesterday was on. I mean, I'm lucky in terms of I'm an academic, so I can do my work from home and I can continue, which I'm very fortunate. But that means it continues nonstop. Um, and so um, what we I can just say what I've done and people should have their own suggestions is um, my son and I came up with a schedule. So he's 12. So that means um, um, yeah, so people have set it daily. So we've set a, so with a 12 year old, I think in an old in an adolescent, you need to set the schedule together because top down, at least with my son doesn't work. So we agreed on time where he would have includes time to play his Xbox with his friends online. So he's doing that with his friends online and includes that time in the schedule. And we have academic time from um, like 10 to 12 and then lunch and during academic time, his school has not assigned any work yet. So it's not really schoolwork. Um, he uses some different programs online, like one's called Brilliant. Um, he's in uh, Scouts, so he can do Scout work during that time. He can read, um, he can do Khan Academy. Um, so I'm not, I haven't been very specific because his school hasn't assigned any work, but um, it's a variety, then a break, and then we have some more time in the afternoon. We've also been meeting friends to, we have dog, a dog to walk our dogs, keeping distant. Um, but it's really been important to have a schedule, and I am pretty strict with it, meaning like he has to start his academic time at 10 a.m., even if, you know, he wants to do something else. Um, but I would love to hear other people's suggestions, especially those with maybe younger kids who have to be directed more. So there are some suggestions that I'm reading from the chat. Um, um, Caroline Fox is saying that families, as someone who is homeschooled for seven years, and now I have a 14-year-old who's attending Brookline High School this year, my best advice is to let things go. Don't stress too much about schoolwork. It's more important to boost their immunity system, eat healthy, get some exercise, and self-care each day. Um, 
Another advice coming uh, from Jill says, uh, for homeschooling, a very specific schedule is needed. Set daily routines, calendar broke down by time slots. Um, utilize a whiteboard to keep schedule visible. Um, there's another question maybe. Uh, uh, before we move on, I just wanted to mention that um, two things that um, some other parents told me is um, if you are co-parenting um, or have another um, person, another, another adult in the household, um, they have developed basically in the family calendar, putting your work, cal work appointments as well. So letting your co-parent or co-caregiver know when you need to be away that way it's essentially like scheduling work and family, everything in one calendar and coordinating it with your partner in an easier way. Um, the other thing is, uh, you know, I, it's a little bit like if you have a need and you search online, although there can be a range of information, one of the things that, uh, you know, I didn't think about this, so it seems so simple is if kids are home, there are parents who've been homeschooling their kids and have all kinds of creative ideas. So if there's a need and you look it up online, there's probably someone kind of specializing in it in their own way. And it feels like parents who are homeschooling or have been homeschooling know a lot about how to kind of manage kids' schedules and finding that balance um, that we could kind of look towards. One of the things that works really well with these schedules is allowing the input from the kids because this is such a stressful time, but I always say kind of have a town hall meeting and in the morning or the night before, talk about what the schedule is gonna look like and how in terms of increments of time, it's gonna be split up. And that's why I suggested a whiteboard. The more everybody can see, as was just stated about the calendar, the same type of thing, one calendar for everything, the easier it is for the kids to see what the plan is. Yeah. yeah, that's a good idea. Thanks, Jill. Yeah, that's a great idea, the whiteboard. Um, and one of the things that people look on the chat that's coming through, which is really important, is to, to maybe lower expectations for those of us um, like myself, who tend to be quite <laughs> goal-oriented and driven. And as Archana said, forgive yourself and kind of cut everyone some slack. Um, so this having the structure super important, but I for myself I need to watch not being overly ambitious. Like it's like I'm going to learn a new Beethoven sonata while in the house while doing everything else, you know. Which I, maybe I will, but um, um, I can definitely add to my own stress by setting these really high goals. Um, Dr. Basu, um, this is. Do you have any opinions about online video games like Minecraft? Um, I think it's, uh, so, you know, my experience is that, um, you know, obviously a, a lot of parents are already saying that the amount of screen time in general is likely to go up. And, um, it might be helpful, uh, especially with older kids, to talk through, uh, you know, that this is a specific and unique context, um, talking about, you know, what the day is going to look like, balancing it out with other activities, how much online time they're going to have, why is it different from what is typical, um, and that it might go back to, it'll probably go back to baseline once, you know, life returns to a more typical routine. I think talking about the rationale for why those changes are happening right now, whether it's increased screen time and why it will uh, not stay that way is helpful in kind of, uh, you know, not getting into kind of negotiations or arguments on a regular basis because you have a shared understanding of why you're doing what you're doing right now. Um, in terms of the types of video games, uh, you know, I think kids tend to play what they've been playing uh, generally, but um, you know, Kirsten gave the, the suggestion and, and actually other parents have talked about this, is if there's gonna be more screen time, thinking about um, in addition to video games, what are some other healthy alternatives to online and screen time? So even if there's a general increase, um, maybe there's a range of things and it's not just the one video game that you know, they're all already playing. But a lot of these remote, uh, you know, games, it's also a way for kids to connect with friends. And so I think it's about balancing that out. Um, 
there's another question, uh, which is how can we safely bring children to the park to get fresh air? What do you recommend, Dr. Basu? Um, well, my number one recommendation is to follow public health guidelines on this. Um, and I've personally experienced this. Uh, you know, a week ago, we uh, were much more readily able to be in the park. Um, yesterday, in the last two days, we've been asked not to, um, you know, use the swings and use the park, the, the smaller neighborhood parks in our area. Um, we did go for a walk yesterday and, uh, you know, my son asked, like he was confused and, and wanted to go in the sandbox and then on the, on the swings. And in fact, in some of the local parks, I noticed that the swings have been taken down, um, the ones that are detachable, and he had a lot of questions about it. Um, so I think the thing is that we are doing the best we can following public health guidelines. Um, if you can go, for example, to um, a larger state park where the landscape is still open and maintain distance, go for a hike, um, as long as that is, you know, within the recommendations and guidelines, um, I think it's a great way to, and important, to stay active and move out. Um, but I think at this point, anything that you know potentially adds a link um, or increases the risk of exposure is something we are clearly immediately trying to reduce. So I think finding ways to do it within the guidelines is the biggest thing. Okay, um, so uh, for folks looking for um, local places, there is a recommendation that the Arbor, uh, the Arlo the Arbor Arboretum has signs with guidance to stay six feet apart, uh, which is, um, a place to explore. Um, let me see. I see a lot of recommendations and advices, and we'll try to um, to go through them and collect them and be able to share uh, with with the group. We'll also share the resources, including the uh, presentation from today with everyone. Shelly, is the best way for uh, folks to fill out the Google form who are participating for the first time in order to get their email addresses? Hi, everyone. Yes. Um, if you would like to get emails, um, especially about the forms as they move forward, um, I sent out a link earlier for a Google form, and I will do that again so that you can in enter your information for us. Okay. So anyone who would like to have access to the resources from today and last week's presentation, please fill out the Google form. We'll also collect some of the, the suggestions from folks, go through them and be able to share with you all. And um, so a couple of things there, um, there were a lot of um, you know, questions and, and comments. Um, and um, so we'll, we will share uh, resources where we can. Um, and um, just some of the things people were asking for some online resources. So just things that I've used over the years. Um, um, some of the things my son has liked when he was younger and still now are Brain Pop, TED Ed. Um, there's actually, as, as Archana said, if there's really a ton of stuff online. There's all kinds of actually home-based like science experiments, which is what my son was into, how to make your own volcano, all kinds of fun, messy things, um, which take supervision. So this is more answering questions of people who have to go to work and the child, their child is being left with a grandparent or something. Um, and so we'll also, we're trying to pull some of those and we'll share them um, with folks. Um, so next week's forum is um, again, to be at the same time, 11 a.m. on Wednesday, 11 a.m. Eastern on Wednesday, and we will send out the information um, and in, the topic is going to be, it's going to be um, by Dr. Christy Denkla and Dr. Carmel Choi. And the topic is going to be flexible and mindful strategies to cope with um, coronavirus related stress, which is something I think we will all need um, even more of in a week. Um, so any other uh, from Archana or Biz, any other final thoughts or comments? We really appreciate everyone joining. I have to say, I was actually finding it quite moving. I'm actually seeing some faces of people that I haven't seen in a long time or connected with. So that's really actually, that really is great. Um, I don't know, Archana or Bizu, anything you want to end with? I would just say that, um, you know, I, 
I personally found it very helpful to think about putting together what ideas or things I would, you know, want to focus on for myself as I was putting this talk together and actually found it, you know, I don't like public speaking, but I actually felt was looking forward to connecting with people. And I think this series of forums, um, you know, and, and things like this is probably going to be really helpful. So thank you. Yeah, and in many ways, I think for all of us, this is um, an opportunity to create a conversation and to share experiences. It's not meant to provide specific um, clinical advice, but an opportunity to create a space where we can talk about the specific uh, challenges around um, um, you know, stress and um, talking to kids and emotional and behavioral issues around uh, this crisis. Okay, those of you who are asking for resources, please, please fill out the Google Forms. I've sent the Google Form links um, and my colleague Shelly has already sent the link. That would be the best way for us to share the resources with you. Thank you very much. Yeah, and people have asked for a Word doc of the group chat and we will see, um, yep, yeah, so uh, Shaylee's on that, I guess, also. Great, thank you so much, everyone, and have a good day and hope to see many of you on other forums in next week. I really appreciate it.